What happened to a young Cro-Magnon woman 28,000 years ago in this French cave? The answer is shocking. She was one of the first modern humans in Europe, a woman who walked the ice-laced valleys of Upper Paleolithic France nearly 30,000 years ago. Her face, reconstructed from ancient bone, might have looked startlingly familiar. High forehead, rounded skull, and features strikingly European. But beneath her calm appearance lies a mystery. On her skull, just above the brow, is a wound, an old healing lesion that tells of a violent encounter. She survived the initial trauma, but she never truly recovered. This is the story of a woman whose death, shrouded in the silence of a limestone cave, offers a rare glimpse into the brutality, resilience, and complexity of Ice Age life. She walked among mammoths and wolves beneath glacial skies in a Europe locked in ice. She lived in a time before the first cities, long before agriculture, when survival depended on the warmth of fire, the accuracy of stone blades, and the strength of the people around you. And yet, 28,000 years later, her story still echoes. Her skull was unearthed in a rock shelter in Les Aises, France, a cave now synonymous with the name Cro-Magnon. Among the earliest known Homo sapiens in Europe, the Cro-Magnon people once thrived, where now only bone and stone remain. One of them, a woman known to archaeologists as Cro-Magnon II, bears a chilling mark of her time, a blow to the forehead, a wound that tried to heal, and a death that came too soon. What happened to her? Was it murder, an accident, the strike of a rival or a family member? Her fractured skull does not just reveal trauma, it reveals humanity, our violence, our tenderness, our fragility and our endurance. To understand this woman's story, we must step back into her world, a continent shaped by glaciers, shifting herds and the flickering light of fire on limestone walls. Cro-Magnon II lived during the Gravettian period, which spanned roughly from 29,000 to 22,000 years ago. This cultural horizon extended across Ice Age Europe, from modern-day France to the plains of Ukraine. Named after the archaeological site of La Gravette, these early modern humans were toolmakers, artists and explorers. They did not merely survive the harsh glacial climate, they flourished in it. They hunted reindeer, bison and woolly mammoths with stone-tipped spears and developed projectile technology like the atlatl, an innovation that gave them the ability to strike at a distance. They crafted sewing needles from bone and stitched together clothing from animal hides to withstand the cold. And they made art, portable and personal. From carved ivory figurines to shell beads and red ochre pigments, their symbolic world was as rich as their physical one was dangerous. Among their most haunting creations are the Venus figurines, carved representations of voluptuous female forms, possibly fertility icons or clan totems. These statues, sometimes carried across vast distances, tell us that Gravettian people valued more than food and fire. They carried ideas, they carried meaning. The Gravettians also buried their dead with care. Some individuals were interred with ivory pendants, animal teeth, ochre and other grave goods, suggesting beliefs about life after death, or at the very least a reverence for memory and identity. Crow Magnon too was a woman of this world. She may have adorned herself with beads, tanned hides, taught children how to nap flint, or prepared meat around a communal fire. She may have sung. She certainly lived among others. And one day something or someone struck her down. Her skull, catalogued as Cranium 4254, holds the answer to her fate. At first glance, the damage on the frontal bone might appear to be post-mortem, perhaps the result of soil pressure erosion or the shifting ground of the burial site. But in 2023, a team of researchers published a breakthrough study in the Journal of Human Evolution, one that changed how we see her death. Close examination revealed that the wound bore signs of healing. The edges were not jagged but rounded. Bone remodeling had begun. There was no sign of decomposition around the injury. No telltale erosion from plant roots or weathering. This was not the work of time and earth. It was the work of violence and survival. She had been struck hard in the forehead. The location of the trauma just above the brow ridge suggests a deliberate, forceful impact. 
It wasn't the kind of wound one receives from falling off a ledge or stumbling into a branch. It came from a weapon or a hand, from someone else. We cannot say for certain what instrument was used. It might have been a stone club, the butt of a spear, or even a thrown object. But what we can say is this. It hurt, and it changed everything. The wound did not kill her instantly. That's the most haunting part. Her body began to heal, slowly laying down new bone at the edges of the lesion. This process takes time, weeks at least, possibly longer, and that means she lived, injured, disoriented, vulnerable. Such an injury would have come with other symptoms, headaches, vision disturbances, dizziness, perhaps even altered behavior. She may have had trouble walking, speaking, or remembering things. In a society where daily life required constant movement and physical effort, she could no longer contribute as she once had. The fact that she survived even briefly after her injury suggests that others helped her. They may have fed her, cleaned her wound, shielded her from predators or the elements. They may have carried her. And this matters. It means that the Gravettian people did not simply leave the wounded to die. They had compassion. They had a sense of care. Even in the brutal Ice Age, even under constant threat, they chose to help. But eventually the injury caught up with her. Whether through infection, brain swelling, or the collapse of her fragile body under stress, she died. The forensic clues cannot tell us exactly what happened in the moment of impact. But they allow us to imagine several possibilities. She may have been the victim of interpersonal violence, a conflict within the group, or with outsiders. Perhaps it was a raid by another band of humans, or a personal dispute gone too far. Perhaps she stood in the wrong place during a hunt, and was struck by a rebounding spear. Or perhaps she was protecting a child or elder when the blow came. What makes the injury so compelling is its position. A frontal impact suggests she faced her attacker, or her accident, head-on. This was not a predator attack from behind or a clumsy fall. It was personal. It was direct. Whether her death was murder or misfortune, it ended with the slow, silent retreat of life from her body. Her body was placed in the same shelter where others would be found. Over time, the soft tissue decayed, but the bones remained. Her skull, weathered but intact, carried the story of her final weeks. When archaeologists uncovered it, thousands of years later, they found no tools or jewellery nearby. No beads, no shells, no figurines, only the mark on her head and the hollow silence of time. But even without grave goods, she left behind something greater. Evidence of survival, of violence, of care. Her skull is a window into a moment in human prehistory when modern behaviours, violence, empathy and burial were already shaping the lives of Homo sapiens. Cro-Magnon, too, was not a passive figure in history. She was a participant in a dynamic and dangerous world. She lived through cold winters, walked with mammoth herds and participated in a culture of art and storytelling. She may have helped create tools, tended to fires, or sung songs in a language lost to time. And in her final chapter, she revealed something profound. Even in an age of hardship and hunger, humans found room for tenderness. Someone tried to help her. Someone watched her suffer. And someone may have grieved when she died. Her story matters because it brings depth to a world we often imagine in stone and silence. It reminds us that the past is not filled with faceless people, but with individuals, with lives, injuries, relationships, and deaths. She was a victim of violence, but she was also a symbol of endurance. Based on the Cro-Magnon DNA, extracted from remains dating to the Gravettian period around 28,000 years ago, scientists have pieced together a genetic portrait that offers clues to her appearance and ancestry. Although the full genome was not recovered, Enough ancient DNA has been retrieved from Cro-Magnon individuals of the same cultural and temporal group to allow for plausible reconstructions. The Cro-Magnon Two women most likely carried genes consistent with what geneticists refer to as the Villa Bruna cluster, a group of European hunter-gatherers who represent the earliest known people with significant modern European ancestry. This lineage is known for carrying genetic components linked to intermediate skin tones and light-coloured eyes, particularly blue or green. One of the key genes related to eye colour is RS1 2913832 in the HERC2 OCA2 gene. 
Many Upper Paleolithic individuals from the Gravettian and Epigravettian periods carry the ancestral variant that is associated with blue or light-colored eyes in modern Europeans. This same variant may have been present in the Cro-Magnon II woman, especially since other individuals from this time period, such as the Bichon Man of Switzerland or the Tagliente Man of Italy, shared similar genetic traits. In terms of skin tone, she likely had an intermediate complexion not unlike that of modern people from the Mediterranean, though some Gravettian individuals show signs of beginning to carry depigmentation genes such as those found in SLC24A5 and SLC45A2, which are linked to lighter skin in modern Europeans. These alleles were not yet fully widespread in the Gravettian population, so her skin was likely not as fair as that of present-day Europeans, but already beginning to show regional adaptation to northern sunlight. Physically, she was robust. Her skeletal remains show a strong, muscular build with a sturdy frame built for the demanding lifestyle of Ice Age Europe. Cro-Magnon women were often nearly as tall as the men of their time and many reconstructions suggest she could have stood between 5 feet 6 inches and 5 feet 8 inches tall, with powerful legs and arms, shaped by a life of constant motion, hunting, gathering and travelling over rugged terrain. Her genetic legacy continues. Many of the genes she carried live on in modern Europeans, especially those of southern and western ancestry. Through her DNA, we see not just her face, but the echo of her resilience, strength and grace in the living descendants of Ice Age Europe. Today, her skull rests in a museum collection. Her wound, once a source of pain, has become a source of knowledge. Through it, we glimpse not just a tragedy, but a truth, that even in the coldest eras of our past, humans felt. They fought, they helped, they remembered. Though the term Cro-Magnon was cancelled in preference for the more clinical, early European modern humans, its use shows a return to the recognition that Cro-Magnon is not only a valid anthropological label, it is a necessary one. It designates a distinct yet foundational population whose genetic and physical traits still echo in today's Europeans. And more importantly, it recognizes their unique identity, shaped by adaptation to Ice Age Europe, robust bone morphology, large cranial capacity, and cultural sophistication. Critics of the term often cite the outdated notion that Cro-Magnons represented a separate evolutionary branch of humans. Some earlier anthropologists proposed they were a superior race or even species. This interpretation has long been discredited. Modern paleoanthropology and genomics, including the studies referenced, confirm that Cro-Magnons were Homo sapiens in every sense, members of our species and ancestors of many modern populations. The term Cro-Magnon therefore does not imply separateness from modern humans. It reflects continuity and Ice Age adaptation. Moreover, the move away from the term Cro-Magnon was driven in part by an ideological resistance to acknowledging the extent of interbreeding between these early modern humans and Neanderthals. Twenty years ago, many scholars still believed in a replacement model of human evolution, an idea that modern humans swept across Eurasia and replaced archaic humans with little or no interbreeding. Under this view, there was no room for Cro-Magnons to be both modern and mixed with Neanderthal DNA. But that theory is now defunct. 